Good morning and welcome to the online service for Sunday the 14th of March. Let me draw an announcement to your attention. On Wednesday night there's going to be a special online midweek from the Council for Mission in Ireland. This week would have been the Mission in Ireland rally but as it can't take place a special online midweek has been produced. It's going to highlight the work of the International Meeting Point along with Balbriggan Church Plant. The convener for the Council of Mission in Ireland, the very Reverend Dr. Frank Seller, will provide a Bible reading and sermon, and this will be available on Wednesday evening. It's hard to believe that this Sunday marks a year since the last normal service was held. Little did any of us know a year ago how different life would look within just a few days. We've been through a lot of changes as a church in the past year. Physically, we've not been able to gather as a church family for most of the year. We've missed fellowship, not been able to draw alongside one another, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice. Missed singing together, praising God together. Missed being the church. And you have done it all in a period of vacancy. But in the midst of all the changes, we give thanks that God has never changed. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This morning, as we begin a new series in John's Gospel, as we look towards Easter, we give thanks that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that out of love for us, he came to die on the cross. As the words of our opening hymn remind us, Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp ride on to die. By your meek head to mortal pain, then take, O God, your power and reign. We worship God. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we thank you for your presence with us. We praise you for all of the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We bring before you now, Lord, our congregation. We thank you for each and every individual within our church family. We pray for those who are unwell, lonely or bereaved and ask that you would draw near to them. We know, Lord, that you are the God of all comfort. And we thank you for the peace that comes from knowing how you care for us. You walk with us and your grace is always sufficient for us. 
We thank you for all of the signs of spring around us and for helping us through the long winter months. We would ask, Lord, that you would bless the farmers as they keep working to provide food for our tables. Help us to recognise and value the vital work they do. We praise you, Lord, for bringing us through the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Lord, for all of the key workers who have continued in their jobs in exceptional and often difficult circumstances. You have blessed us, Lord, with the rapid development of a vaccine. Please bless those who were involved in its inception and those who are administering it. Help us to be truly thankful for the hope it brings and may we remember that you are indeed a God of hope. Deepen our faith, Lord, as we often struggle with doubt, frustration, temptation and weakness. Help us to cast our cares upon you today and may we remember the words of the psalmist. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth, in your name we pray. Amen. A Dark Night in the Garden The wind was picking up now, blowing clouds across the moon, shrouding the garden in darkness. Stay up with me, Jesus asked his friends. They said yes and waited under the olive trees, but they were tired and soon they fell asleep. Jesus walked ahead alone into the dark. He needed to talk to his heavenly Father. He knew it was time for him to die. They'd planned it long ago, he and his Father. Jesus was going to take the punishment for all the wrong things anybody had ever done or ever would do. Papa, Father, Jesus cried, and he fell to the ground. Is there any other way to get your children back, to heal their hearts, to get rid of the poison? But Jesus knew there was no other way. All the poison of sin was going to have to go into his own heart. God was going to pour into Jesus' heart all the sadness and brokenness in people's hearts. He was going to pour into Jesus' body all the sickness in people's bodies. God was going to have to blame his son for everything that had gone wrong. It would crush Jesus. But there was something else, something even more horrible. When people ran away from God, they lost God. It was what happened when they ran away. Not being close to God was like a punishment. Jesus was going to take that punishment. Jesus knew what that meant. He was going to lose his father. And that, Jesus knew, would break his heart in two. Violent sobs shook Jesus' whole body. Then Jesus was quiet, like a lamb. I trust you, Papa, he said. Whatever you say, I will do. Suddenly, through the trees, a glitter of starlight flashed of steel. Into the quiet garden came whispers, muffled voices, clanking metal, and the sound of boots marching. Jesus stood up. He woke his friends. Now is the time, he said gently. Everything that was written about me, what God has been telling his people all through the long years, It's all coming true. And into the night, with burning torches and lanterns, with swords and clubs and armour, they came, an army of soldiers. Judas led them straight to Jesus so they could arrest him. Jesus was waiting for them. Peter leapt up, took a sword and tried to defend Jesus. He sliced off a guard's ear. And Jesus immediately touched the guard and healed him. Peter, he said, this is not the way. Peter didn't realize that no army, no matter how big, could ever arrest Jesus. Not unless Jesus let them. Then Jesus, who had never done anything except love people, was arrested as if he were a criminal. 
Jesus' friends were afraid, so they ran away and hid in the dark shadows. The guards marched Jesus off and took him to the leaders. The leaders put Jesus on trial. Are you the Son of God? they asked. I am, Jesus said. Who do you think you are to call yourself God? You must die for calling yourself the Son of God. Only the Romans were allowed to kill prisoners, so the leaders made a plan. We'll tell the Romans, this man wants to be our king, and then they will crucify him. But it would be all right. It was God's plan. It was for this reason that I was born into the world, Jesus said. reading is taken from John chapter 18 verses 1 to 14. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kindred Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who did betrayed him, 
knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Amen. Before we come to study God's Word together, we're going to listen to a piece from Stuart Townend and the Gettys entitled Gethsemane. Our passage this morning starts from the arrest of Jesus, but this hymn helps us to comprehend something of the anguish and the turmoil that Christ went through in the garden for us. In the garden, he knew very soon that on the cross, he was going to take the weight, the curse, the punishment of every sin that has ever been committed. He was going to face the judgment of God, and he was doing it for us. This is Gethsemane. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. To see the King of Heaven fall in anguish to his knees. The light and hope of all the world now overwhelmed with grief. What nameless horrors must he see to cry out in the garden? Oh, take this cup away from me, yet not my will, but yours. Yet not my will, but yours. As we come to God's word, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for Jesus. And as we think about this passage in front of us this morning, as we're confronted with all that Christ went through for us, Father, help us to see you more clearly and to respond in wonder, love and praise. Amen. It seems very strange to believe, doesn't it, that this morning marks one year since we had our last normal Sunday in the church building. We had no idea how radically different our lives would look less than a week later. This past year has been one that none of us will ever forget, especially not our political leaders. Boris Johnson had thought that Brexit was going to be his biggest challenge. Robin Swan had no idea what he was going to have to face whenever he took on the role of health minister. COVID was completely outside of their control. All they could do was respond in the best way that they could with the changing situation in front of them. Well, here in our passage in front of us today, here in John 18, we see events take place which to most people at that time came as a complete shock. It seemed like a crisis. It was a devastating blow to all those who'd followed Jesus. Because here we see Jesus' ministry brought to a sudden end as he's arrested, 
put on trial and execute it. But nothing in the events of that first Easter were outside of God's control. Nothing took Jesus by surprise. This was all part of the plan of salvation. The prisoner under arrest, well, he was the prisoner under control. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he had said the hour would come. The time would arrive when he would be glorified. Until now, the hour had not come. But on this Thursday of Holy Week, Jesus knew that the hour had come. If you look back to chapter 13 and verse 1, we read this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, the time had arrived. And after warring in prayer, being in turmoil and anguish, sweat drops of blood falling to the ground, he led the disciples out across the Kidron Valley to the garden on the other side, to the place where he knew his persecutors would arrive. John tells us in verse 2 that Jesus met there often with his disciples. But on this night, they are not the only people heading to the garden. Verse 3, Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus is there with his disciples and then Judas arrives with a large group of soldiers to arrest Jesus. They've come in force and they've come en masse. It was a quiet, out-of-the-way spot. They no doubt thought it was going to be ideal to make an arrest. The religious leaders and the Romans didn't want to take any risks, so it was likely that this was a large group of soldiers indeed. It's dark, so they've come with torches and they've come with lanterns. Perhaps they thought they might have to chase Jesus across the dark hillside. And they've come armed. They were, prepared, they were prepared for whatever they would have to face. I don't know about you, but if I find myself in that situation, I'd be running away as quickly as possible. To be praying safe and secure, surrounded by friends one minute, and then to be faced with a mob coming out of the darkness the next, well, that's enough to make your blood run cold. But look how Jesus responds. Verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? We cannot miss the fact that Jesus is in complete control. He knows what is happening and he knows what will happen. He's not naive. He's not out of his depth. Knowing all that would happen. How often have you heard it said? Or maybe someone has said it to you. It's as well we don't know what a day brings. And there are certain days that when we've got to the end of them, we're thankful we didn't know what lay ahead that day when we got out of bed that morning. But Jesus knew perfectly well the absolute horror that awaited him. Never did knowing scripture give anyone more reason to sweat blood. He knew every Old Testament prophecy. He knew what was going to take place, but there was nobody else. He was the only one who could step forward to save us. It's a story which movie writers have used time and time again over the years. We've seen it happen a lot in films. The movie's reaching its climax. The people are in imminent danger. The enemy is looming, and the hero, knowing that the fight will cost him his life, steps forward to defend his own. Armageddon, Saving Private Ryan, Gladiator, and the list could go on and on. But they're all pointing us back to the ultimate hero. Jesus stepped down into a broken world with no hope of survival. He willingly sacrificed himself, dying a brutal death. He died to defeat Satan, sin, and death and to secure victory for us. Knowing that the fight would cost him more than his life, he stepped forward into battle to save his own. Jesus could have fled before the soldiers arrived. He could have scattered the soldiers with a word. But what does he do? He steps forward. He makes himself known. 
He puts himself in the midst of danger and he does it willingly. He didn't go to the garden to hide. He comes forward and asks, who is it that you want? Last Sunday evening, we were thinking about Genesis 3 and how Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. They were put out of the garden of Eden because of their sin. But here in this garden, here in John 18, Jesus walks out of the garden to meet those who will crucify him and crucify him not for his sins, but for ours. And so verse four, whom do you seek? They answered Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas who betrayed him was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. This large group of soldiers, these trained men of battle, they come to this garden. They see a handful of men there. They can outnumber them. They have the weapons. Jesus says, I am he, and they fall to the ground. This group of hardened soldiers drew back. They retreated and they fell down before Jesus as he uttered the words, I am he. Jesus says it twice in verse 5 and verse 8, and John repeats it in verse 6. Jesus had said these words back in John chapter 8, and at that time the Jews wanted to stone him. To say, I am he, was to take the name of God, the name that God had said to Moses back in Exodus. Here as Jesus is arrested, he is declaring that he is God. And so the soldiers draw back, fall down, and we're wondering, did they see something of who Jesus was? Did they catch a glimpse of the glory and majesty of the Son of God? Most of those soldiers would have had no idea that when Jesus said the words, I am he, he was taking them back to the book of Exodus and what God had said to Moses. So did they grasp something in that moment that this was no ordinary man? This was the Son of God. Jesus walks towards them knowing what they intend to do to him. And he says, I am he. I'm the one you're looking for. Judas, the betrayer, the traitor, was there to point Jesus out, but there was no need. Jesus makes himself known. I am he. All those soldiers, all those weapons, but it's Christ who's in control. And now Jesus turns his attention to the protection of his disciples. Look at verse 8. I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I've lost not one. Jesus will not lose anyone. Jesus' concern for his friends is right at the front of his mind, so he demands that they're free to go. The amazing thing is that he knows that when they leave, it'll be the last he'll see of them till after the resurrection. In other words, he knows that they're going to abandon them, and yet he cares for them. He loves them. That's why he's doing what he's doing. That's why he's giving himself over to these soldiers, knowing that it's going to lead to the cross, knowing that there he's going to take the punishment, the judgment that we all deserve to face but he's doing it because of his love lavished out upon us. Peter pulls out his sword as if to say, leave it to me, Jesus. Don't put yourself into this situation. I'll sort it. And whether he meant to take off the ear of the high priest's servant, we don't know. Luke tells us that Jesus healed the man, but John here records what Jesus says. Verse 11 Put your sword into its sheath, Peter. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? God's method of bringing in his kingdom was going to be very different. Not the way of the sword, but of sacrifice. There is no physical cup in the garden. The cup is a symbol of God's anger and wrath at sin. To drink the cup is to take on that judgment and anger onto yourself. For Jesus to take that cup is to take all the anger, wrath, and judgment of God on himself. 
Notice this is what the father wants the son to do and the son wants to do it. Peter wanted to sort the situation through the sword. Jesus says the only way people will be safe is if he drinks the cup. Jesus' words, I am, caused the soldiers to fall at his feet. As they crawled upon the ground, Jesus did not run. The king of all the earth allowed them to arise and arrest him. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world was being led to the slaughter. But he is no mere victim. If he is to go as a lamb to the slaughter, he is going willingly. He is going because this is the Father's will. He's arrested and bound and taken to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. The high priest who John tells us in verse 14 advised the, advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. And speaking of those words, he said more than he realized, didn't he? This is exactly what's about to happen. Jesus could stop this at any moment. And yet in complete control as they bind him and lead him away, he's choosing to drink the cup, choosing to do the Father's will, choosing to take on the sins of the people so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have life everlasting. So what are we to do? Well, I think there are three options. Firstly, we can reject him. Judas had been with Jesus. He had heard Jesus. He'd seen the miracles, and yet here he is guiding the mob to Jesus. He's betraying his master. Maybe you've been coming to church services all of your life. You've listened to sermons for years, but you haven't seen Jesus for who he is. Judas was there. He followed Jesus. He heard and saw it all for himself, and yet he rejected Jesus' rule over his life, and he rejected Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Do not reject Jesus, but instead accept him. And that's the second thing we can do, is accept Jesus. Maybe you're listening this morning and you've recognized something of the beauty and majesty of Jesus. You're in awe that the I am, the very Son of God, would die for you. Well, put your faith in him. Follow him. Trust him. Ask him to forgive your sins and to come and live in your life. You won't regret it. Pick up the phone and give me a call. Talk to any Christian you know. Do not let today pass by. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you've done that, well, that's the third response. And that is worship. Jesus is the great I am. Jesus is God. And the Son of God chooses to take the cup. Jesus chose to take on all God's anger and judgment that we deserved upon himself. He died in our place on the cross. Isn't that amazing? We can hardly comprehend it. That's how much he loves us. Jesus says in verse 8, If you're looking for me, then let these men go. It's what he does for us. Jesus drank the cup so that we could go free. It says Jesus is taken that his followers are released. He goes away to die so that they may go on to live. Literally, the disciples fled and were not captured, and Jesus was taken and arrested. But in a more profound sense, it's by Jesus dying the death we deserve that we are set free from sin's condemnation, set free from Satan's grip, And so ensuring that not one of those given to Jesus by his father will be lost. We can trust Jesus. He will never lose us. We are eternally secure in him because of what happened at the cross through his death and resurrection. In a moment, we'll sing these words in our final praise. And surely this is the most appropriate response when we comprehend something of Jesus and his love for us, 
as we wander in awe that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For me it was in the garden. He prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grace, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvellous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvellous, how wonderful is the Saviour's love for me. I stand in the garden. Oh. 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. Amen.